The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. Think of this show in this way. Rush Limbaugh and Howard Stern had a child, and that child grew up to have a podcast about building science. This is the opposite of that. Here's Bill Spohn. Welcome back to the Building HVAC Science Podcast. It's our goal of BHS, Building HVAC Science, to help create better, more knowledgeable HVAC and building performance technicians and contractors by helping the two professions better understand each other with the ultimate goal of making customers happy in the homes they live in and the buildings they work in. Understanding each other, that's an important thing. On this podcast, Gary McCready and I attempt to understand each other and sort of our perspectives on things. Now, if you're in the HVAC field and you've listened to podcasts, you've likely heard of Gary McCready. And if not, here's your chance to get an inside perspective on the how and why of how Gary got into the HVAC field and later started a podcast audaciously named HVAC Know-It-All. Now, that's tongue-in-cheek, of course. Throughout the episode, Gary and I flip-flop as interviewer and guests. Now, Gary has recently started his own business as he, like many others, including me, do not like taking direction from others. Follow all the content of HVAC Know-It-All at HVACKnowItall.com. And Gary is one of the growing list of true friends, talented people in the trade that we list on the True Tech website. If you go up to the, the very top of the page, you'll see a link to True Friends. And there's also a link in the show notes. I have links to Gary's and my LinkedIn bios also in the show notes if you want to do a little bit more research on who's talking at you today. So listen in as Gary and I have a nice conversation. Welcome back. You should say welcome back too, Gary. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. This is a different episode. You haven't done one of these in a while. So we're doing a joint pod swap podcast episode, both building HVA science and on... I guess we're doing it on HVAC Know-It-All and myself, Gary McCready. I guess I'm your guest. You actually asked me to be part of your podcast and I appreciate the opportunity. So I think Bill and I just came up with an idea. We're going to interview each other on this podcast and we're going to split it up and it's going to go out on both of our channels, which is, I think it's a cool idea. Sure. And kind of like cross fertilize the listener base. Exactly. Why don't you go first and give me a little bit of your background and summarize it up to the point where what's your latest and greatest endeavor? I've been in the industry for since I was 18 years old and I'm not afraid to reveal my age. I'm 43 years old, so 25 years. And the first two years was in school, pre-apprenticeship school. And then I spent 22 years with the same company, pretty much 22 years about. It was all commercial work. So it was school, right into a company that did commercial work. I did a little bit of residential while I was in school in the summers and stuff like that. I didn't really like it all that much going into people's homes because I broke some lady's window with a, with a piece of gas pipe. And I almost broke my jaw with a hammer drill because I'd never used a hammer drill before. And the guy I was working was like, here, just go through that wall with the hammer drill. And I'm like, it got stuck in the wall and it actually swung back and hit me across the chin. And I'm like, I was probably concussed, I would imagine. But anyway, fast paced, I got really bored with my life in the trade because it seemed so repetitive, the same customers. Uh, and I had a bit of a creative side to me. So I decided to create a blog named it HVAC Know It All. I took a lot of heat for that. But to explain to you and your audience, it's a very sarcastic name based on many different things, based on a bit of humor, based on some of the conversations I've had with people that will never admit they don't know, and they'll just make stuff up. And the fact that the mission is to attempt, you'll never know it all, but attempt to know as much as you possibly can. And collectively, within a group, there's always somebody that knows something you don't. So collectively in a group, maybe you could know it all collectively, but not individually, because there's no possible way for that to happen. And fast forward to this week where I just actually started my own business, which took nine months in the making. So nine months planning, and that was partly due to the fact that I had to wait nine months on a vehicle to be ready. So that's the fast track story. And you operate out of, where do you work from? So I'm in Canada. I'm in the Toronto area. Most of my work 
in my life in the trade has been in the greater Toronto area, just outside of Toronto in the hub of the city too. But I live about an hour and 20 minutes north or so of the city. So I did have a commute quite a bit. And lately I've been working really close to home the last couple of days. I had a, my first service call was 10 minutes north and I'm doing an install that is five minutes down the road for me next week. So that aspect I like, it's going into residential now and teetering both, which I'm not really used to, but I like the fact that I can drive up to a driveway and pop out of my van. I'm literally like 10 steps away from the machine because I've never had that before. Different world. So want to hear about my background? I do. I do want to hear, I know that you were with Testo and yeah, you started True Tech Tools and all that stuff. And I would love to hear how that all came about. My trainings as an engineer, but I had this interest in starting my own business since I was in high school and worked for Eastman Kodak Company for a while, worked for a company called Fisher Scientific Lab Instruments, then worked for Backrack actually for 10 years, and then Superior Valve making uh, refrigeration valves for a couple years, and then Testo for 10 years. And then at partway through my experience at Testo, met Jim Bergman who attended a trade show that some of our people were at and he started asking a lot of questions and he wouldn't stop asking questions. So they turned him over to me (laughs) and he had this insane thirst for knowledge about how to do testing correctly. And that's why I say like he really blossomed from some real basic learning into being what he's doing today, which is just real brilliance with between measure quick and having developed on manifold and all that. So he, his dad, actually, he and his dad started True Tech, and they were like, hey, what should we carry in inventory? Like after they got this thing started, I'm like, well, let me take a look at things. I was like their business advisor for about a year, a little bit more than a year. And then it really shot up and it grew really fast. And his dad was like, hey, I wanted to make this a retirement hobby, not another job. So at that point, his dad's like, I think this is worth something I could sell it. And I'm like, well, hang on a second. So his son and I bought out the majority of his shares. We were co-owners until 2014. And then Eric Preston came in and bought out his dad's shares. So Eric and I are now co-owners since 2014. Nice. Do you know what sparked the idea of True Tech Tools? Because it's different. It's not your traditional brick and mortar type. You walk in and you have a smoke and you sit down on the stool for an hour. It's not that kind of place. It's more like an e-commerce type business, right? Yeah, definitely. I would say I was born out of frustration. It was like Jim and I shared this frustration from different angles, but he became aware of all these test instruments. It's like these things answer a lot of problems, a lot of questions. And I've been working in that field since Backrack since 1988. And it's like not enough people use these kind of tools. What the heck's the matter with people? And so it was this frustration. So we thought there's a, probably a big enough audience nationwide to support a store but there's not enough audience locally to support a store that just focuses on test instruments. So it had to be e-commerce. And it started in, the launch was actually in April 2007, so it was almost exactly 15 years ago that it launched. And it's, e-commerce was still pretty new. I mean, there's been websites and e-commerce out there probably since the mid-90s or late 90s. So it was about 10 years into it, but things really exploded in the last five years, of course, with e-commerce. So it's born out of frustration. Yeah. I have a question for you regarding how you, because right now I would say True Tech Tools is one of the first or not maybe the first to start using the, I guess, air quotes, the HVAC influencer, because you guys started to work with Stephen Rarden first. He's like the OG, right, of some of this. And whose idea was it to reach out to somebody that's making videos and say, hey, let's send this guy some stuff and see what he can do? I think it just came as a polite request from Stephen. And I want to oh, say- Oh, it came from him. Okay. Yeah. I want to say it was like 2012 or 2013. Probably it's like the OG of the community was HVAC Pro Talk, which was a BBS bulletin board service. I don't even know if you know what that means. <laughs> it's just pretty ancient stuff. But it, people had this huge community of sharing ideas, concepts, topics, Q&A, a lot of what happens on the different Facebook pages, but it was like the place for things to happen. And I actually had a conversation with somebody today, Eric Kaiser, and we were recalling when we first met. And we met because there was 
It's called HVAC Pro Tech Forum, run by a guy named Tony Berlin, who has since passed away. And Eric and I met in 2006. So this is probably like 2003, maybe 2002, when Tony started this Pro Tech Forum. There were some like rumblings in like a tiger of different spots or a pretty of different spots of people seeking community. And it's really advanced in the last few years to do that. So yeah, I think Stephen just, I can almost remember visualize where I was when I first talked to him. And I'm like, I like your videos. I like your approach. I like your style. And he's like, can we work on something together? So that's how it started. I hate using the word influencer. I don't know what it is about that word. I just don't like it, but it is what it is. So how many influencer type people is True Tech Tools using to date now from that one? There's probably about 10 that we're in correspondence with and maybe four to five that are really more active. Mm -hmm. And it's all different kinds of things. Like a lot of it's, they want to be able to gauge their audience. So we do the coupon code thing and the influencer coupon code, and that allows them to track things. That allows them to get some benefit from working with us. And then we get some benefit from working for them where our name gets out there. But I wouldn't say it's approaching saturation, but now we're like a little bit more scrutiny when we pick somebody. It's like, okay, what's the difference here? What's not already covered or taken care of with an audience group or an approach? Mm -hmm. I got one more question about this and then you can fire back at me. So how have you found that this pool of influencers has helped your business in just getting the name out there in the growth in sales? How are you finding that has helped? I think it's helped a great deal. I give a lot of credit because the objective is we stay top of mind. However, even though we're just top of mind by mentioned or, or whatever, we still have to fulfill on our promise to be good to the customer. Yeah. So it's a warm introduction, but then we can't be introduced to a group of people and then let them down. So it requires work on our part, but that's our goal is one of our internal mottos is we want to be the least hassle for our customer's day. And I think part of it's through influencers and just paying attention to social media that we, I think we know, I can't say fully appreciate, but I think we know to a certain extent what it can be like to be a technician with all the different pressures that come your way from the client, from the dispatcher, from the boss, from traffic, <laughs> from the parts not being in stock in the parts house to a flat tire, to just the dog at your biting your heels as you're walking up to the door, all these things. We don't want to be another hassle in your day. So we just try to be as smooth as possible. Yeah. I say that to a lot of people I work with too, because I have partners within the industry and I always make it clear to them. I said, I'm not here to sell your products. I'm here to showcase them and show people how to use them and what they're for and how I like to use them. But it's up to you to sell your product. <laughs> it's not up to me to sell it. It's, I will take it and use it and demo it and stuff. But when they land on your website, it's now up to you, like you were saying, to really focus in on that customer and make sure that you treat them well and they'll come back, right? For repeat business. Yeah. One of our things that we stress, it's actually in our core values is clarity, clarity of communication, like how many are in stock? What are your shipping options? What's the price? What are the details on the product? What goes along with it? Just being absolutely clear and fast about that communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes a ton of sense. I'm going to flip that question back at you. Who are your influencers? Who shaped the Gary that I'm talking to now? We did a live with Trevor Matthews last night and we just did some basic refrigeration chat and we had about a hundred or so texts on there and it was pretty cool. This is the second one we did. And I was talking at the end of that about positive influential people that don't necessarily have to be within the trade you're in, just people that are positive influential people within your life. And I've listened to people like, I go through phases. I went through a Tony Robbins phase and I watched a bunch of Tony Robbins videos I found it really uplifting and I listened to a lot of Gary Vaynerchuk kind of on the same level as Tony, but he has a different spin to it and stuff. I've listened to a lot of, I don't read a lot because I find at the end of the day, my eyes are just too tired to read and I'll read a few pages and I'll put a book down and I'll never get back to it. So I've been finding that I've been listening to a lot of books lately as I drive and most of the books I listen to, they're not stories, like they're not fictional stories, right? They're real life stuff of motivational, not always motivational, but for instance, I read a book or listened to a book called The Art, I think it's called The Art of Negotiating. I can't remember the exact title, but it's, I think it's a former FBI agent and he's talking about how to negotiate with people 
and I listen to that to try to hone down negotiation skills. When anybody, when talking to anybody, talking to my kids, talking to my wife, talking to customers, talking to people at the supply house, and hey, you throw that in for me. Which <laughs> I feel like I get a lot out of listening to stuff like that, just from people that have been there and done it, and they're giving you the advice because they've been in that position already, and you can learn a lot from that. So, anything that's real life, I'm really focused on. One of our good friends in the industry, I don't know if you know him, Steve Kasha. He does customer service training. I don't think so, no. Yeah. He's really great. He's come in to train our team a couple of times, but he mostly trains customer service teams for HVAC service contractors. One of the things one of our people made a comment on when he came in the last time for training is we had everybody go through, even people in the warehouse go through, because we looked at it like life skills, that negotiation, that communication, the listening before you act kind of thing just can be a good life skill. Just interacting with people in the public, interacting with family members, things like that. There are definitely different influences that they don't always have to be the technical influences. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. I totally agree with that. To be honest with you, I don't really have a lot of influencers in this trade. I do and I don't. I say that because I have a brand of my own. I feel that if I'm listening to everybody else, I feel it it might influence the way I approach things, where I like to try to approach things in my own way. And I don't, so I operate in a vacuum that way, where if I listen to five podcasts about HVAC refrigeration today, maybe I'll just start saying things and rhyming off things that I heard them say, where I don't really want my content to be that way. I want it to be my thoughts and my ideas. And I feel that could influence that, not in a negative way, but just in a way where it's not totally me that's coming out. It's influence from other people. And that's not always a bad thing. It's just, that's the way I like to do it. I just like to operate in a vacuum that way. I get my influence from, I guess, non-technical people, I would say, and visit outside the realm of the trade when I'm trying to get some motivation for myself. So what got you to start your own business? Is it an idea that's been brewing for a while? or I've discovered probably a long, long time ago that I really don't like taking <laughs> direction from other people. Me neither. I don't like taking direction from other people. I can do it and I can bite my lip because I have a lot of patience as a human being in general, but I do not like it. I just had so many ideas, so many things I wanted to implement. Everything. Think about every aspect of a business uniforms, the truck you drive, the software you use, the tools you use. I wanted to choose all that for myself. I wanted to be me. I wanted to show who I am in this industry and not be part of an entity that tells me what to do. That's really what made my decision. I just, I came to a fork last summer. I had a friend that started a business a couple of years back. He's doing wildly successful. He's just a one man show with an apprentice, but doing really well. I had a friend that he's worked in the business for many years, but his boss wants out of the company. So he bought into it. Now he's buying the company. I'm getting motivation from just talking to my friends that are in business for themselves. I just came to this fork and I felt that through the brand that I created, HVAC Know It All, it gave me a bunch of resources that I didn't have five years ago. And that thought process coupled with the resources that I had created through this brand I'm like, it's at this point for me, it's a no brainer. If I don't do it, I'm going to regret it. I just pulled the trigger and that was it. I used to feel a lot of stress when I was working for other people. I wasn't getting everything done, the right stuff done or whatever, some plan or was something wasn't achieving. And even though like, and I share the weight with Eric, I will say that, but there are like 20 people that depend on us (laughs) to not screw things up. But that weight doesn't feel the same in terms of stress on me. And it's because the great thing is everything's in your control and the crappy thing is everything's under your control too and and all your decisions make a difference. But we started out small. Literally, when I came out in the business, it was myself and Robin, Jim Bergman's wife, working full-time and his dad working part-time. And then we started to grow from there. But when it was very small, it was like, I'm answering the phone, entering the order. Robin's packing the boxes. Jim's checking the order. So it's, I think growing with a business, like growing your own business, it gives you a certain sense of pride, but also an inside track 
to knowing how it should be built. Again, with those personal preferences you talked about from the outward things, the truck, the tools, the uniforms, things like that, but also the inward things like how do you comport yourself? How do you respond to customers? What are your internal philosophies for dealing with customers? I agree with you 100%. And, and I think what you said, answering the phones, inputting orders, it's funny you say that because that's what I'm doing right now. I'm answering the phone. I'm going to training. I'm repairing machinery. I'm inputting receipts into my app. And I was just showing my wife how to, because I'm going to get her to do that stuff for me because I will go berserk. So we sat down at the kitchen table and I'm like, okay, this is how you get into the app. You hit this expense tab. You pick the accounting code. You take a picture of the receipt. You put the total in. Now she's on board. She's got it. But because I'm going through the motions as a new business owner and hitting all those steps, like personally hitting all those steps, I know how the business runs from the ground. So once I get five years down the road, 10 years down the road, I'm going to know like everything that there is to know about the business. And that's different from somebody coming in that's say the business has been built up and somebody comes in just because they got a lot of money and they want to invest and they just buy it. And now they sit at a desk and make decisions. Well, they don't know how that business was built. So they don't have the inside track, like you were saying. You mentioned the blog, HVAC Know It All. Did that come about before the podcast and then the app? How did those things sequence out? It sequenced out from being on Facebook and being on a particular <laughs> a particular Facebook page that everybody knows that it's just all bad jobs and bashing each other and stuff like that. And I'm like, there's got to be a way to flip the script here and do something positive. There has to be. And I'm like, I've always loved photography. In high school, I did photography. In high school, I did graphic art. In high school, I did video editing and stuff like that. I was never like the best at it, but I enjoyed it. I've always had a bit of a creative side. So I said, I'm going to start a blog. And I posted this on LinkedIn maybe about a month ago. And it was a picture of Kevin Costner in the movie Field of Dreams. I think it was a picture of him or it was a picture of Ray Liotta who played Shoeless Joe, I think it was. Anyway, my whole mentality around it was if you build it, they will come. That was just what I kept saying over and over in my head. If you build it, they will come. So I just made a Facebook page, literally sat for a couple of weeks trying to think of a name. And I'm like, what should it be? HVAC guy, HVAC dude. And I know some people don't say HVAC, they say HVAC, but up here in Canada, it seems like we say everyone says HVAC. So it was like, it hit me one day. I'm like, HVAC, no at all. I said to my wife, she's like, are you sure that you want to call yourself that? And I'm like, no, I'm not calling me that. I'm calling the brand that because of this and because of that, and because of this. And for basically about a year, I had to explain to people what it meant because <laughs> I got targeted because of it. And I had, I went through a lot of bad experiences because of that name that I've spoke about before, but I got over it and I just moved on. So yeah, it was a blog on Facebook first, and then it transitioned into Instagram and LinkedIn. And I set milestones for myself. It was like, if I get a thousand or five, I can't remember the number I set, but if I get 500 followers, I'm going to get a logo because now it's legitimizing. I'm like, if I get a thousand followers, I'm going to look into a website. And then it just, I saw Instagram. I'm like, I better get on that because it seems to be a legit platform. And anytime I saw an opportunity, I just kind of went for it. And that was it. And that's one of the motivational points I get from a guy like Gary Vaynerchuk. He's like, if you're half decent at something, you don't have to be the best. If you're half decent at something, it's what you're doing already. Double down on it and go all in. And I took that to heart and I just went for it. I think it's building, they will come. That's like an element of faith that you have. It's like you have a concept that you think resonates because you've got enough experience and you've talked to enough people. I think that's the same thing with True Tech. We did a build it and they will come kind of thing. Now, one of our internal phrases is stock it and they will buy because things are so hard to find <laughs> anymore. Yeah. We just make sure we have a lot of stuff in stock. And our purchasing manager just said we hit a, a milestone in inventory level the other day. But we try to, again, make it the least hassle, communicate what we got and take care of people. And it does take faith. I mean, there's people's livelihoods, inventory, loans, all those kinds of things at stake here. But having that faith and having a perspective that you care about your customers. And we also care about our vendors and employees, of course. But our vendors like a little different element in our mix where we look out for vendors, see something bad, something going amiss online. 
we'll try to step in there and help customer through it or make sure the vendor gets involved because sometimes things can spiral out of control. Oh yeah, I've definitely seen it spiral out of control with many different products. And I always behind the scenes, I'm like, hey, we're talking about your product on so-and-so thread here on this platform. And there's people that are saying things that might not be true. If you want, jump in and rectify these things. And a lot of times that's happened and it's actually settled the conversation down. Yeah. And I think just even the interest that you can help bring the vendor to the table. But one thing I was thinking about, you mentioned all those different social media channels. Do you have somebody helping you with that or is that just all Gary? No, it's just all me, man. It's been crazy. I've developed a method where it just intertwines into my life at this point. In the beginning, it was difficult because you're trying to learn how these platforms work. But for instance, a lot of my content repeats itself across the platforms because the audiences are different. So a lot of times it's like the same picture, copy and paste the caption, and it's just platform after platform, the five platforms in a row, just post, post, post. And then you reach everybody. There's obviously going to be an overlap Let's take Facebook, for example. So let's say Facebook might have 25% of my audience on Facebook is probably also on Instagram, just as an example number. But at the same time, even though they might see it twice, you're still reaching a wider range of an audience than if you were just to post it on, on one. Because I'm lately I'm finding that even the generations are on different platforms. Like Facebook seems to be the generation where it's the older texts and stuff like that. Instagram's kind of like the Gen X, maybe some millennials. And then TikTok is like Gen Z. What's after Gen Z? I can't remember all the generations. <laughs> and then LinkedIn is more a professional back and forth. And it's a lot more respectful in that manner where Instagram's like, yo, what's up, bro? Like fist bump. <laughs> Facebook's a lot of yammering back and forth. A lot of flame icons and stuff. (laughs) Yeah. And and Facebook's a lot of arguing and negativity a lot of times. It's every platform's got their own identity. And that's how I describe them is like Facebook's the older crowd. You want to get into a fight? Go to Facebook. Instagram is camaraderie. TikTok's new. I'm just getting used to TikTok. It's growing fast. It's a good platform for even true tech tools to be on. It just started off as dancing and silly videos and stuff like that, but it's actually growing into a more legit platform for other stuff too. And it's a wild ride, but I've intertwined it into my daily life. What keeps you producing content? Where does it come from? It just comes from my daily experiences, pretty much. That's exactly where it comes from. If I'm on a job, literally I'll just set my phone up and that's where it comes from. Or if I see an opportunity for a cool looking picture, I'll snap it. And I'm already standing there on the job site. It's not like it takes any effort to do it. You're already standing there. You're pulling a vacuum. You're sitting there, maybe just tidying up or waiting. You just take out your phone and go and snap it. So it's very natural, especially because you don't have to go somewhere else to create it. You're already standing there and it's just a natural transition to create the content at that point. And it sounds like that goes back to your interest in photography and video editing and just being creative in your own person, your own messaging to deliver there? For sure, it does. My content for podcasting comes from people I know or run into in the field, and I just think they've got an interesting story to tell or something I want to know. So I often think of my podcast as just like my own personal diary, and if you're interested, listen to it, but it's for me. (laughs) My podcast is for me. So it's for True Tech Tools, but it's my life is interwoven in that so much too, to my wife's chagrin, because you know, things like podcasting at eight o'clock at night, it's like, what are you doing? Oh, come on. It's time to do it. Yeah. And you've probably learned so much from interviewing all these people, right? Absolutely. It's knowledge for you because you just the amount of stuff I've learned from interviewing people is unbelievable. It's nuts. And that's what I wanted to ask you is because your podcast is based on building science. And that's something that I'm over the last 10 months or so, I've been really trying to learn more about. We've had different guests on the podcast that are also into that, like deep into that, like really nerdy about it and stuff like that. And what is your definition of building science? And other people say this in different ways, but the house or the building is the system that you're trying to condition for, you keep the indoor climate correct but you have to take into account what that envelope is and what it's made of, how it transfers heat, how it transfers air. If you don't take that into account, 
you're sort of working with one big unknown in your equation, and you're probably not going to solve it, except perhaps at the cost of energy or maybe even discomfort. And the discomfort aspect comes from the fact that I don't think systems are still like evolved completely. There are a few rare cases, and some people are doing it on their own now, like Nate Adams and Michael Hausch are doing things where they're not hot rodding, but they're putting together systems in their own houses that are what the next generation will be. Control of humidity, dehumidification, control of temperature, control of mean radiant temperature off, off the walls and surfaces, control of the drafts, the air velocity moving out of vents. Like the house that I built, my goal, and I don't think I've quite achieved it, but I've come close, is that I want the HVAC system, which includes ventilation as the V and the VAC, to be totally unnoticeable. Like you don't know it's there. It's just like, wait a minute, I'm comfortable. I'm still comfortable. Things have changed outside and I'm still comfortable. That's to me what the ultimate system would be. And that's for residential. I know industrial refrigeration, some of the other work that you've probably done so much more in your career, those have certain like operating set points, but for residential and even office space, it's about satisfying like the human needs for comfort, which go a little bit beyond just set points. Like a thermostat isn't going to make you comfortable. It's going to make the air temperature correct at that spot on the wall. That's right. Yeah. But that might not be making you comfortable where you're at. Do you know Robert Bean? The name has come up, but I don't know him. No. Really, really cool guy. Yeah, he was one of my influencers as we designed our house. A big impact. Two things was mean radiant temperatures of the surfaces, like the windows and the walls, so that heat isn't actually radiating on your body or being sucked away from your body. And then the other thing was aging in place, single floor living. And he talked about some designs that he does like that. So we incorporated like those or two of the main factors we incorporated in the house that we built. Can you explain that main mean? Mean radiant. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because I've never heard that term. Yeah. Like, you know, when you put your hand near an oven, you feel the warmth coming off the oven. Yeah. If you can make it so the temperature of the walls is close to the temperature of the air, moving closer to a wall or further away from it won't feel any different than working in the space. But as you get to like a colder wall that is losing a lot of heat, say in the wintertime, you're losing a lot of heat from a wall, that inner surface of the wall might be down to, the interior temperature might be 72, the wall might be 67 or 62 or God forbid like 50. You go near that wall, it's like, I don't want to be there. Your body rejects it, or you got to put on extra clothing. And, and his concept was if you're built, you've bought, you've designed, and you're renting, or you bought a house, that there's part of that space you don't want to be in. So it's wasted real estate, wasted square footage. Yeah, it's a very good way to look at it. Instead, put it into making that, that insulation and that air tightness so that that surface is at the air temperature. Now you've just purchased that real estate back. Yeah. So that would go into, obviously, the construction of the home, like the type of insulation you're using, the how many panes the windows have and all that stuff. Right. And the air leakage, the air sealing. And also, you want to have basically like a thermal blanket all the way around. You don't want to have areas that, due to structural members in the wall, that they become like heat fins, like a coil, or like the protrusions on a coil, where you, you want to have a break in the thermal radiation in or out from a surface. So like in our house, we have, I think it's an inch and a half of expanded polystyrene that's everywhere there's a wall. There's still the wall, there's the sheathing, then there's this expanded polystyrene, which is going to be like the final down vest that's covering the whole house to keep heat out and keep heat in. Cool. So I got to ask you this because when you were building your house where you obviously had to hire a contractor that was aware of all of this, were you the GC on this or did you hire a consultant to come in and say, make sure that this is all done right as far as all this stuff that you're talking about? So good question. I had two things working in my favor. One was, first was an interest in building a passive house, which is a whole large topic about, it's a design concept that's started in the U.S., grew in Europe, now it's growing again in the US. 
but about homes that basically interact passively with the energy grid that they don't use as they generate as much on site as they use perhaps so we were interested in that and we found a builder who was trained in that but hadn't built a house like that so they understood all the concepts they had put in time to get in the training cuz they wanted to do projects like that plus i had a friend for about the last 10 or 15 years who was an energy rater a home performance contractor remodeler and i hired him as my energy consultant to review the design to review the house as it was built and be the third party quality control from an energy and durability aspect water heat air moisture management that's the building science terms it's a good one ham if you like ham heat air and moisture managing those three things can start you on the road about thinking about making a better performing building very interesting so you explain a passive home is your house a passive home no, it doesn't meet all the criteria of that. The criteria to me is just it, it's expensive to build single family, standalone in the field type of houses. Multifamily, it becomes a lot more economical because you have so many shared surfaces. You have less exposed wall area for the amount of residential space that's inside. But single family passive, in our case, it was harder to do in a budget. So we approached it and we got like one of the parameters is the air changes per hour, the air tightness of the house. There's a factor called CFM 50 leakage or ACH 50, air changes per hour at 50 pascals, test pressure. The goal for passive house is 0.6. We achieved one. But the building code in the US, the tightest building code is three. So we're already three times better than the tightest building code in the US for air tightness. Very cool. Does your home do any, is it any self-sustained energy? Like do you have solar panels? Do you have anything like that? that yeah, we have solar panels that come pretty close to break even in terms of they generate as much over the course of a year that we use in the year. So our utility allows us to bank the kilowatt hours. Even like the last few days, it's just been that shoulder season weather. We've had the windows open all day long, close them up at night, stays warm enough and everything. So we haven't run the HVAC for about four days. So our consumption is very low, but when it's sunny out, we're generating. And so the meter literally goes backwards. It's a net meter. And they only bill us for the forward, what we use beyond zero. So Cool. I'm interested in the mechanical stuff you put in your home because I've been learning a lot about this lately. Like for instance, heat pumps, in place of natural gas fired equipment, but dual fuel as well, where you might use like a wall mounted boiler and, and have a hydronic coil that will heat your domestic water, but it also put water through the domestic coil if the heat pump is having trouble keeping up if it's really, really cold outside and just different aspects like that I've been really learning about and enjoying learning about. So what mechanical systems did you put in your place? It's a little bit of a risk, but it hasn't turned out to be negative at all. We didn't bring any gas onto the property. Okay. And it's funny, last year, July, the local gas company, their truck drove all the way up our driveway. I captured them in a security can, sat there for a minute, turned around and left. I was like, <laughs> they wanted to see like what the heck's going on up here. They didn't buy gas, but is it really a house up here? Yeah. <laughs> so we did a, three different energy models of the house to predict what will the load be for the design what kind of system we need, and could we do it with a heat pump that was a high-performance heat pump that worked down to low temperatures. So we have 2,800 square feet on a first and second floor and 1,600 square feet in the basement, and the basement's conditioned too. It's not finished finished, but it's a slab and walls and wallboard and stuff. So we're basically 4,400 square feet, but some of it's subgrade is what we condition. We were able to do fine last year, which was our first full year in the house, down to minus four Fahrenheit with a two-ton air source heat pump without running any resistance. Nice. So do you have backup just in case, like electric heat or anything like that? Yeah, we did put a little precaution in there. We have a 10 kilowatt heating, which is basically converts to around three tons. Okay. So it could actually, if the heat pump just lost a charge or whatever, or ice fell, they couldn't, but say a nice 
bomb hit the outside unit, we could run with just the coils. But I said it so the coils were off all last year because I wanted to see where's the balance point? Where do we start to slip and need auxiliary heat? We came close at minus four. The design temperature here is nine Fahrenheit. And we went down to minus four and basically didn't need the backup. But we also were real friendly with the sun. I calculated this the other week. We have 66% of our window area is south facing for the whole house. So there's a lot of glass and we have a slightly higher solar heat gain coefficient. So we're actually pulling energy in in the wintertime. So we're cheating the heat pump thing, but we have a tight structure, well insulated, good amount of solar gain in the winter. And then with that two ton air source heat pump, we could do it. So that going back to the house as a system, you see how that comes together with the glazing, the insulation, the air tightness, all these things working together. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So what about ventilation? Are you doing any ERV, HRV? Yeah, have to, because it's so tight. So what I found, this product has been out there for about a decade. It's called a CERV2, C-E-R-V. So it's a conditioning ERV. It's a separate unit, and the ventilation system has separate ducting. So the ventilation pulls the return, or we call it the exhaust, basically, from the kitchen, the bathrooms, the laundry room, and a, a large closet. So it's sort of all the stale or air you want to take out. Supplies go into the bedrooms in my office Okay, because I'm full of hot air. <laughs> but I'm in here so much that I want eight hours a day, nine hours a day. I want to have the fresh air in here. So that system actually has a third of a ton heat pump in it. So beyond just exchanging air, it can actually extract the energy from the air either leaving or entering to move it to the, the exhaust air. And it does a little dehumidification too. So in the summertime, the exhaust, the cold air going out blows over a coil. That coil then again transfers over and it cools down the air coming in and it dehumidifies the air coming in. That's cool. I like that idea, the whole concept of that, to temper the air, to make it a little bit more easier on the system once the air gets inside. I think the, when did I have this conversation? Probably before Christmas. I don't know if you've heard of them, but the company's called Oxygen 8 and they do that stuff too. James Dean. Yeah, I know him. You can actually pre-order the equipment with a, like a Dakin evaporator installed in it. So you pipe it over to a condensing unit and it will maintain whatever temperature you want coming into that home from the, the supply going to the ERV. So if it's- Yep, to the ventilation air, sure. Yeah. So if it is like minus four outside Fahrenheit, you can temper that air and, and bring it up to put less stress on the system in the house, which is pretty cool. So how long did this whole concept take, the design, the build, and everything before you got in there? The design really started in like January of 18. The house was built, actually it was factory built. I don't know if you knew that as a modular build. Yeah, I've, I've heard you say that before. So it was actually built in pieces in a factory. Is that how it goes? Right, yeah, four big boxes. So it's called volumetric modular. There's also other kinds of modular where they're like panelization and things like this. But this is like the full volume of four boxes of all that above ground square footage was built in a factory and hauled over on a truck. That actually took a month to build the four modules in October of, of 19. And we didn't, like we're working on the design from January to August. And in August we signed like final design concepts, design notes to the factory because they had to buy all the material, do all the planning. And this is also all pre-pandemic. So there was not a lot of stress on in terms of getting materials and stuff, but it came probably delivered about 85% done. So doors were installed, windows installed, no appliances, but counters were installed, cabinets were installed, bathroom fixtures, flooring, rugs. Much of it was painted. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So what made you decide to go that route instead of having it built right in place? A, the builder understood these energy concepts, and that was pretty much the only way they built. So it's like, we build modular and we understand energy and like, oh, that's cool. Well, let's take a factory tour. So they just had one lined up just by accident. We went and saw actually the builder's father and son, the son was building his modular house at the time we toured the factory. So we got to see his modules couple months later, they were setting them on site. We got to see the setting day. 
Then we went back and while we were meeting to design our house, we were inside his house. So it's everything he did showed us that it could be done very well, executed very well. And in fact, my energy auditor friend, his name is Rhett Major, he and I said to the son, we want to test your house. We want to do a blow at our test in your house. I want to see how you build your house because <laughs> I want to have mine. Can you do it? In other words, and he's like, yeah, I think we can do it. So we went ahead and tested his house and it came out around one ACH 50, which is where I wanted to have mine. It's like, okay, you can build them that way. So let's do it. Very cool. I would love to build my own house one day. That's kind of a dream that myself and my wife have, but it's not within reach just yet, but maybe a couple of years, a few years down the road, we'll see. But it's definitely a dream to do something like that because like I said, it's not comes back to the not taking direction from other people. Like when you go and buy a home, like it's like, okay, there's the house. It's already built like that. You go to a builder in a new subdivision. Okay. Here's our models. There's not really any way to customize them. There is to a certain extent, but not really anything major. So it would be super cool from scratch to go to a builder, say, this is what I want. This is how I want it designed and just go from there and just build it from scratch. I think it would be a very cool process. It was cool. I mean, this, we had to work, of course, within the limits of the factory size for the module. And actually, like literally, what could they bring up to the property? How big of a box could they bring in on a trailer up to the property? Our modules were 64 feet long, 14 feet wide, and 11 feet tall. And they were able to bring it in up this road. But the other thing about designing your own, it's you have to be able to visualize the space and the layout. And if it's significantly different than what you're living in or, or friends of yours or relatives of yours, you have to like question that. And, and some people are really good at space visualization and other people need to see it physically, the model of it. So yeah, it wasn't entirely easy to do that. There were some things like we see this little image on a screen. That's what it's going to look like even though it's a 3D rendering. so yeah. It's going to get easier with, I don't know if you've ever put a set of Oculus goggles on, but that's all coming. They're going to design a house that you can walk right through before you buy it very, very soon. Oh, you're absolutely right. Is it Interplay? You think you know them? Yep. Doug Donovan's company, been at a couple of shows and put those goggles on. It's like, that's just totally wild. Yeah. I just had them on in March and I was perplexed. I'm like, wow, like I got on my knees and I'm like looking up and I'm like, I can even look up inside of things. It Tilting was, your head. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was amazing. But like both my older son and my middle son both have a set of Oculus Quest and my son gave them to me. He's like, look at this. And I'm like, I put them on and he's like, this is like 360 view. And basically you do a 360 and it's, I was in Egypt, like looking at the pyramids. And then we go to another video and I'm in Africa and there's this elephant. I'm laying on the floor and there's this elephant basically walks over me and his tusk is swinging and almost like hitting me like in the face. It was, it's wild. I can see why kids really gravitate towards them. And I was watching, I stuck them on and put on a YouTube video, but you can go into this mode where it's like you're sitting in a movie theater. It's actually like you're sitting in a movie theater. The screen is massive in front of you. It's wild. It's kind of dangerous in a way, maybe because who knows what's coming with these goggles. Like people, they won't be going on vacation anymore. They'll be sitting in a, <laughs> in a room with some goggles on. They'll put you in a nice relaxing state. They'll put some goggles on you and you'll be on holiday. Put you in a trance. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gary, it's been fun having you on the podcast. Thanks for agreeing to do this mutual sharing of both podcasts. Hope this works out well for you. Oh yeah. It was great talking to you, Bill. And you and I have spoke through messaging and email and stuff like that, but we've never actually sat down face-to-face -face was as close as face-to-face -face as we're going to get. So it was really cool talking to you and getting to know you better. Sounds good. Well, take care and want to thank the listeners on both podcasts for spending some time with Gary and I. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode that I kind of came up with a silly name for it, two peas in the podcast. I don't know where that came from. Anyway, if you want to keep up with other things that I find interesting, you can follow Building HVAC Science on Facebook or follow us at True Tech Tools. Go to our website, sign up for the newsletter, follow us on Twitter or Instagram. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the Building HVAC Science podcast, please email me at bill at truetechtools.com. The Building HVAC Science Podcast is a production of True Tech Tools Limited. Thank you for listening, and hopefully you have a great day. Until next time.